Thank you for joining today. Uh, my name is Clint Rose. I am the uh, CSO of Puregen Biosystems. And today I'm excited to talk to you about unlocking the value in your FFP samples. Brief background on Puregen Biosystems. Uh, we founded the company in 2012 uh, and our mission really is to develop revolutionary sample prep solutions to help customers get the most out of each sample. Uh, core technology was invented by Professor Santiago, uh, his team at Stanford University. Uh, company is in the San Francisco Bay Area with a great group of investors that includes both Agilent and the Roche, Roche Venture Fund. Uh, let me explain isotachapheresis. This is the core technology that we've developed uh, around. Isotachapheresis, or ITP, uh, uses charge as the primary separation uh, principle. So uh, in this case, we're taking advantage of the key attributes of nucleic acid, which is that it is both highly charged and uh, its speed that it will move in an electric field is actually independent of its length. So no matter whether you have short DNA, short RNA, long DNA, long RNA, will all move at the same speed uh, in free solution. The characteristics we get from that is that all of the extractions are then solution-based. We're not binding to a surface, uh, therefore we're not needing to wash. There's no elution uh, process. And the benefits this gives us is no risk of bias, and I'll show you a little bit about that later, as well as the best representation of the nucleic acid. Uh, our goal is to get you every bit of nucleic acid we possibly can out of each of your samples and to make sure we're not biasing that sample in any way, we're not changing that sample in any way. Uh, with this, you're getting high yield, high quality, uh, and all of that is built on a very simple workflow. Now, let me explain ITP in a little bit more detail. Uh, it is charge-based, as I mentioned before, uh, and we're really taking advantage of, of couple of key ions or key buffers that we're using in the solution. Uh, the first is what we call our leading ions. Uh, these are the blue ions that I'm showing you here. And these are fast ions. We actually select these to be ions that are much faster than the nucleic acid. Uh, the second key ion is what we call our trailing ion. That's what you see here in the red. Uh, and those are ions that we select to be slower than the nucleic acid, but actually faster than all the impurities within the system. We then utilize our microfluidics to actually line up these buffers in order in our microfluidic chip. Uh, we start by having these red ions in the back. Uh, that's what we call our cathodic buffer. We next have our sample. And the sample is very important in that we've developed our own lysis chemistries to enable us to get access and free that nucleic acid while being immediately compatible with the ITP process. The next buffer is our separation buffer. Uh, that's those blue ions that we talked about, those fast ions. And the last is our extraction buffer. And the extraction buffer is actually designed to be immediately compatible with all the downstream applications you might have. Once we turn on the electric field, we apply current, uh, all of these charged molecules and ions start to move within an, that electric field. Now, because the nucleic acid is slower than the blue ions, it can never pass those in, in the microfluidic channel. However, it's faster than all the red ions and therefore it's speeding ahead of those. And you get this very tight band where all the nucleic acid is collecting at the interface between the blue and the red. Now, again, because the nucleic acid is so highly charged, it's actually moving ahead of all the impurities. Those are falling back behind. They're getting separated away from the nucleic acid. And this process continues. That nucleic acid actually physically moves through the chip. Uh, it arrives in the extraction well, the system detects its arrival shuts off the current to that lane, uh, and then you can come in and collect that nucleic acid. Now, I showed you the cartoon version. I'm going to show you what that actually looks like within the chip. Uh, this is a zoomed in view. Uh, we're going to take a look at our typical microfluidic chip. This is eight channels running in parallel. I'm showing you genomic DNA, in this case dyed, just for demonstration purposes. But what you can see is that tight ITP band. That's actually the genomic DNA itself. It's moving through. The microfluidic chip, uh, it's being separated away from all those impurities. It's being put into that extraction well on the left-hand side. Now, if we look at that with respect to what the ions are doing, you can see the nucleic acid is being moved to that interface between those blue ions and those red ions. 
Uh, and because the nucleic acid itself is so fast, those impurities are falling back behind. So you're getting a separation uh, at the same time. This process continues, as I mentioned, uh, the nucleic acid will move through the chip. Uh, the instrument will detect that it has arrived in the extraction well. Uh, at that point, you can come in with your pipette, pipette out the nucleic acid, and now that's ready to go on to the next step in the process. Let me tell you a little bit more about the system. So the system is based around a, a bench top uh, instrument, uh, really easy to use. Uh, we made the instrument small and compact. It's about the width of a standard laptop. Uh, it has a touch screen so that all of your protocols are right in front of you. All the instructions of actually how to walk through that protocol right there for you. And then for each of the applications we developed, maybe it's a different sample type, uh, we have application specific chips. And those, those kits uh, actually come with a chip as well as the necessary chemistries that enable you to do the extraction that you uh, would like to for your particular tissue type. Uh, the advantages we get here is that we have the simple workflow. I'll talk you through that, uh, as well as very high yield and very high quality. Now, once we get to the instrument itself, uh, as I said, we've really focused on making this as simple as possible. Uh, so you take your microfluidic chip, you put it onto the instrument, you then load your running buffers. Uh, these are the buffers necessary to make the ITP process work correctly. Uh, and that's very simple. That's just using a multi-channel pipette, uh, pipetting in the, the appropriate buffers into the appropriate wells. Uh, press a button, the instrument then primes or puts all of those buffers into the appropriate locations within the microfluidic chip. Uh, instrument will then open back up. Uh, at that point, you can load your lysate. Once the lysate is loaded, again, press the button, say go. Uh, and about 50 minutes later, all of your extracted nucleic acid will be sitting in the extraction well, ready for you to pipe that out and move on to the next step in your process. I'm going to focus on our three FFP kits today. Uh, we have our FFP to pure DNA, pure RNA, as well as our FFP complete kit, which enables you to start with one sample and get both DNA and RNA from the same sample. So focusing on the DNA kit first, uh, as I mentioned, one of our primary focuses was making sure that we simplified that workflow as much as possible. So compared to a, a standard column-based kit workflow that you see above, uh, our process uh, is so simplified, we just want you to scrape uh, from your slide or take a curl, drop it directly into our lysis tube. Uh, and then for the lysis process itself, we're actually lysing, deparaffinizing, decrosslinking, all in an incubation step that is completely hands off. Uh, we simply use a thermal mixer that enables us to automate this process. Once you have your lysates, those then go on to your ionic system, as I described before, enabling you to purify uh, and then collect that DNA ready to use. Uh, and we estimate it's about five minutes of hands-on time per sample through this process. Now, significant benefits from using ITP for these types of extractions. Uh, this is data where we did a 32 block study. Uh, as you probably know, FFP is complicated in that really, in order to understand how well you're doing, you have to go on a block by block basis because each block it can give you very different results. So for this study, we looked at breast, colon, and lung blocks. Uh, and in each case, uh, when we look at the amplifiable or usable yield coming from each of those blocks, you can see that we're significantly outperforming a standard column-based kit. Uh, on average, we have about three and a half times more amplifiable or usable DNA coming out of each of these blocks. Now, the second thing we did is we wanted to ensure that this DNA that we're getting uh, and the significantly more DNA that we're getting is actually then translating to better success in doing NGS. And so what we've done is we look at a sequencing assay, in this case, an amplicon-based assay. Uh, we're utilizing a very high quality reference sample to effectively reverse engineer the assay. We really wanna understand what the expected coverage profile should be for this assay. What that means is we wanna know for all of the targets, over 200 targets in this case, uh, what's the expected number of hits we should get for each of those targets. With that information, we think we can then compare the high quality data versus the extract data from the purigen kit versus the column-based kit. 
And this is what that data typically looks like. Uh, here, what we're looking for is we're taking those standard number of hits for each of the targets uh, for the particular assay. We're taking the number of hits that we get for, say, the ionic system. We divide by the reference. We take the log. That should go to zero. So ideal data would be data that is sitting right on top of the zero line. Uh, and then what we're looking for really is to see uh, either for the ionic or the column kit, how many data points are falling below that zero line. That basically tells us we're not getting the coverage that we expected for those particular targets. Now you can see in the image above uh, on the top there, several of those orange dots from the column kit are actually falling below uh, that zero line. Uh, and as we zoom in a little bit more and look at this data in a couple of different ways, we can start to see the reason why. On the left bottom, what I'm showing you is this coverage ratio versus the length of the target. And what you can see is for the ionic system, we have very consistent coverage uh, from the very shortest targets to the very longest targets uh, for this particular kit. For the column kit, you can see that as you start to get to those longer and longer targets, we actually start to get less coverage from the column kit. Now, for we also look at the GC content. And for the GC content, what we see is that, again, for the ionic system, you get very consistent coverage independent of the GC content, whether it's high or low uh, content. Now, for the column kit, what we'd see is as you start to get higher and higher GC content, we actually start to get lower coverage. So there's a coverage bias associated with the GC. Now, the most important question is, is how does this translate into the answers we're looking for from these very special blocks? Uh, and this is the uh, very specific example that we can provide. Here, we're looking at a comparison of the variant calls from a single block. So we took this single block and we put either one, two, or four five micron sections into an extraction on the ionic system and extraction using the column-based kit. Uh, and when we look at the coverage, what we again see is very consistent coverage, independent of the number of uh, sections that we've put into the ionic system. What we see for the column-based kit is that it replicates the data I showed you on the previous slide, uh, which is that in many cases, we're getting very poor coverage for some of these targets. Now, this is also then translating into our ability to detect the variants that we know are in this particular block. Uh, in the ionic system, uh, even with a single five micron scroll, we were able to detect 25 of the 26 known variants. Uh, and as soon as we went to two scrolls, we were able to detect all 26 and consistently do so. With the column-based kit, uh, we missed five of the variants when we only had a single five micron section. Uh, and even when we went up to four sections, uh, we're still missing three. Uh, and this is all due to this poorer coverage. Next, I'm going to transition and talk to you about our uh, FFP to pure RNA kits. Uh, so very similar to the DNA kits, uh, a simplified workflow. Again, uh, kind of three simple steps. The first one being our uh, paraffin removal and lysis. That's all happening in a single tube. Uh, we're then taking that lysate, we're putting that onto the ionic system and allowing the ionic to actually do the extraction for us. Now, uh, similar to the DNA as well, uh, what we found is from a, a total RNA, uh, here you can see based on qubit, uh, we're taking 10 micron sections, we're looking across different tissue types. Uh, this is different tissue amounts that are actually going in. Uh, and again, comparing against a standard all of RNA column kit, what we see is we're getting about twice as much RNA uh, out of each of these sections. Now, one of the very nice benefits we have for this particular kit is that we can get microRNA as well from the exact same extract. Uh, this is not a separate kit. Uh, this is just both mRNA and microRNA coming through into your extract. Uh, and so what we did is for several blocks, we also compared the amount of microRNA that we could get from those blocks versus the amount of microRNA you could get from the same blocks using one of the leading microRNA column kits. Uh, and what you can see is if you look at the undetectable signal here, uh, basically the dropouts uh, in several cases for the two microRNA targets we're looking at here, there were several dropouts with that column kit. Uh, whereas in all cases, we're able to get a detectable amount of microRNA. Now, the next important question uh, is, is how are we doing in terms of, of looking at the, the gene expression from each of these samples? 
Uh, it's much more complicated to get sort of a reference RNA. Uh, and so what we're doing is we're just looking at how well correlated we are against the expression profile that you would get from a standard RNA column kit versus what you're getting from the ionic system. Uh, and what we see is across each of the tissue types, in this case using uh, Lumina's AmpliSeq, uh, we're getting very good correlation. So picking up the, the same targets that you would expect uh, coming out of that column kit. Similar analysis, looking at the microRNA that come out. Uh, and obviously these are the, the few examples where we were actually able to recover some microRNA from the RNA column kits. Uh, in this case, on the left-hand side, what we're showing you is replicates. So these are two separate extractions that we've done. We wanna make sure we're getting consistently uh, the same profile, expression profile um, between our replicates. And you can see we get very good correlation between those two. Uh, and then similar to what I showed you on the previous slide, in this case, we wanna again confirm that the expression profile we're seeing from the ionic extraction is similar to what we're seeing from the column kit. And you can see that we have very good correlation here as well. All right, so <clears throat> those are our DNA and RNA specific kits. Uh, our newest kit is our ionic FFP complete purification kit. And with this kit, what we allow you to do is actually uh, get both DNA, RNA, and microRNA from us one simple workflow. Uh, <clears throat> the way this works is very similar to what I've showed you previously. Uh, you're going to drop your sample in. Uh, that lysis process will remove the paraffin. It will lyse. Uh, and then as a next step, we're actually going to split that lysate into two. We're going to take half of that lysate and we're going to extract the DNA. We're going to take the other half and we're going to extract the RNA. And those can actually be run side by side uh, on the ionic system. You can run in one lane to get your DNA. Uh, in the next lane, you can actually pull your RNA. Now, even though we're splitting that lysate in half, we're still getting very good performance against standard uh, ex column-based extraction kits. Uh, what you see here is on the left-hand side, we're showing you the RNA yield. Uh, and this is total yield uh, via qubit. Uh, about 1.2x uh, yield improvements. When we look at the amplifiable, uh, in this case, looking at the beta actin expression, uh, again, from 10 micron sections, the yield improvement is about 1.2x as well. So nice performance, even though that extract is split in half. Looking at the DNA, our yield performance is roughly equivalent. Uh, we have um, on the left-hand side here is the total amount of DNA we're pulling out from those 10 micron sections. And on the right-hand side is the amplifiable yield. So again, across different tissue types, uh, across different tissue amounts that are going in, uh, strong performance. Uh, I do also want to mention that in this case, we have the ability to uh, further improve that, that DNA yield uh, by simply doing an optional overnight incubation. We find that with an overnight incubation, uh, we can actually dramatically improve the amount of amplifiable yield we're able to get um, from our complete kit, uh, up to 2.7x improvement there. Uh, and then obviously the last piece that's very important is the amount of hands-on time. So uh, we've compared this against two very typical uh, column bead-based manual workflows. Uh, and the hands-on time is about 75% less for the ionic system. Uh, what that means for you is that you can process eight samples in with as little as 90 minutes hands-on time. Now, I also wanna talk uh, very briefly about some of our future applications. Um, this is one of the new kits we are releasing very soon, uh, which is our tissue to DNA kit. So this is looking at fresh frozen, frozen tissue uh, and actually extracting uh, from those, those sample types. In this case, uh, I'm showing you the different tissue types of interest um, ranging from uh, higher yield tissues, things like spleen that have lots of DNA in them, uh, to lower yield tissues, things like breast, which have very little DNA in them. Uh, and what you can see is a comparison in terms of the amount of nucleic acid uh, versus the amount of tissue that went in. So this is a micrograms per milligram comparison. Uh, and very similar to what I showed you for the FFP. Uh, the ionic system is fantastic at getting you a lot of DNA, uh, much higher than you can get from a column-based kit. The comparison here uh, is against two different column-based kits. Um, in one case, we're looking at a, a kit that recommends a 50 microliter elution. Uh, the second kit actually recommends a range 
ranging from 50 microliters to 400 microliters. Uh, and in all cases, you can see the ionic system is outperforming those. Uh, our median uh, is about a three and a half fold increase in the amount of DNA that you're able to get out. Uh, we are constantly working to expand our applications menu. Uh, you can see in the available now, all of our FFP kits are available now. Uh, in development and to be released in the next few months, we have our cultured and sorted cell kits, uh, as well as our uh, fresh frozen kits. That'll be both DNA and RNA. Uh, lots of future applications in the work as well, uh, ranging from plasma to different types of separations. So to summarize, uh, Purigen is working to really redefine genomic sample prep. Uh, we wanna place a heavy emphasis on getting you as much material as possible out of each of your samples. And as I said, getting you the best representation of that starting sample, ensuring that we're not creating any bias and we're not damaging the nucleic acid in any way. Uh, I've shown you data for the very high yields we get from the FFP samples, uh, the very simple workflows uh, that enable you to process these uh, and, and really do that with the greatest of ease. And uh, we're enabling the ability to do NGS from lower quality or lower content samples. Uh, we always like to hear back from you. Uh, we'd love to understand what sample types you have, uh, the different workflows that you may be using, and of course the challenges. We'd, we'd love to take on any of the challenges you may be facing.